If you make your way 800 kilometers north of Perth, you'll find yourself at Murchison and at the largest component of the square kilometer array. Now, we haven't made that trip. It's a long way to travel and we don't have permission to film there. Instead, I've come to the Perth Hills to construct my own radio array. One thing we do have in common, however, are the flies. In the long term, this is our best chance at discovering an alien civilization. But immediately, there are some spin-offs which might help reduce our electricity bills. The next big exciting thing in radio astronomy is the square kilometer array. It has a collection area of one square kilometer when you add each of the different listening antennas together. Just like your pupil expands in order to let in more light, allowing you to see in the dark, by having this larger collection area, we can receive much fainter signals. If you were to add together all radio waves that we've received from space in the last 75 years of radio astronomy, then all of that energy would be less than I've just given this feather by lifting it only a few meters above the ground. The square kilometer array is going to change all of that, collecting more energy than ever before. We're all familiar with radios, and the older ones among us might also remember when they had long extendable antennas. This is an actual MWA dipole used on the square kilometer array. It's also known as a spider, and you can sort of see why. Each of these legs are just the same as the aerial from our radios, except they're listening in to something much, much fainter. I've constructed a representation of the different radio signals that our spider might be observing. At the moment, it's a bit of a mess. Things like human radio transmissions, exploding stars, and colliding black holes get in the way of the alien signal that we're trying to find. So how do we isolate it? The star explodes off in that direction, and the radio waves come hurtling towards the Earth. First, the spider antenna picks up a signal. Next, the Christmas tree. Then, spider two, spider three, and spider four. Let's collect those signals together to discover what happened with the explosion. Here are all of the radio signals. They're still a bit of a mess. But if we account for both the speed of light and that these were in different positions, we can start to make order from the chaos. Spider number one, we're going to leave that in the same position. But for Christmas tree one, we know that that was two meters behind the spider. So we're going to be moving it up two of the time units, about 10 billionths of a second. Next, we have spider two. Now that was three behind it. So we're going to move it up three time units, about 15 billionths of a second. We're going to be doing the same to the other boards now. When we add in these time delays, a clear signal emerges. Moving around these planks and adding in time delays is just the same as physically moving the antennas. Except that when we physically move them, we could only listen in on one direction. By having the array pattern and using specific delays, we can listen in on the whole sky. Eventually, the square kilometer array is going to have over a million receivers spread across both Australia and South Africa. In order to interpret the data, we're going to have to use something a little better than moving around planks of wood. We're going to need a supercomputer. I'm at the Pawsey Supercomputing Center, located just outside of Curtin University and the home of the Magnus Supercomputer, a machine capable of unlocking the secrets of the square kilometer array. Fiber optic cables run from the receivers and Murchison into the Galaxy and Magnus machines. Time delays added and calculations performed, with the results being written to a storage cluster and then backed up to tape. The supercomputers produce a lot of heat, which we need to get rid of in order for them to work effectively. You can see here some water pipes, which are being used to keep the system cool. These water pipes perform the same function as the fan in your computer, cooling down the electronics to avoid spontaneous combustion. After heating from 22 degrees Celsius up to 29, the water is then pumped into a nearby building, where it is cooled back down to 22 and recirculated into the computers. Usually a supercomputing facility such as this would use cooling towers to facilitate heat exchange. But as you can see, that's not the best option. Cooling towers work by evaporating water, taking away heat in just the same process as sweat evaporating from your skin. Unfortunately, once it evaporates, this water is lost. Perth just can't afford to waste the 30 million litres a year 
required for this process to work. Instead of resorting to high energy intensive refrigerant based cooling, Pawsey instead takes advantage of its unique position above the Mullaloo aquifer. The water in this aquifer remains at a constant 21 degrees Celsius year round. From 100 meters in depth, this cool water is brought to the surface, where it then goes into the heat exchange building. Now at 23 degrees Celsius, it is returned to the aquifer. Additional reinjection points use cool water to help manage heat redistribution. Zero water is lost, and because the water in the aquifer remains at the same temperature year round, it works regardless of weather and season. At the moment, we have a really cool supercomputer, but so what? A typical business will be spending in the ballpark of $12,000 a year on air conditioning. For a skyscraper, you're looking at over a million dollars. We could be using some of the techniques we use to cool the Pawsey supercomputer and apply them to normal air conditioning. This isn't difficult to do. We would just be rerouting the cooling systems for the water that we already use to cool down the air. If we were to do this, we would save so much money a year on air conditioning, as well as severely reducing the amount of greenhouse gases we emit when we produce electricity. Massive thank you to everyone who made this video possible, and in particular, Aditya and Neil from the Pawsey Supercomputer and Greg from the SKA. What would you do if we discovered an alien message? What would you say? How should we respond? Let me know in the comments below. I'm about to head off to NASA, so get ready for some awesome space videos. Make sure to subscribe so as not to miss them. In the meantime, this has been James Singley from the Atomic Frontier. Keep looking up.